Hello, hello, and welcome to Non Sequitur News. This is a Time Machine episode for August 2nd, 2024, Season 3, Episode 215. I have transferred my consciousness to a Raspberry Pi, just like the sentient AI above me. I, too, have a visualizer now. Good evening, hometown citizens. Welcome to Non Sequitur News. <laughs> I am Merwat, and that was the sentient AI from the future who uh, was caught off guard because I've transferred my consciousness, like I said. So today we're going to be talking about uh, NZXT to rent gaming PCs, a first mover advantage, salon owner versus L'Oreal, feline taste testers. Oh my God, look at their DNA, New Jersey. Amphibious cars in Amsterdam. Airline swaps in hot pockets instead of noodles. Go figure. Using a drone to deposit mosquitoes. Murder mystery tabletop game. And a hypervirulent superbug spreads. All of it's powered by hometown.com. So we'll see you on the other side of this. And I just turned off my studio lights because I don't need lights because I've been transferred to a Raspberry Pi, just like the sentient AI above me. Pretty interesting, huh? That's what happens in Gnome Town. You ready to get into all of today's articles? I am. Oh, and you'll notice that while I have a visualizer that is based on me speaking up above the computational power that's necessary for the same AI is represented above me. Not the little dashed lines up above, but the, the uh, little, the, the neuronal representation. Uh, you know what? Right maybe, here. Yeah, maybe I'm a little too inside baseball for that. All right, let's get into today's news. First articles over in non sequitur news, NZXT will rent full gaming PCs rent $60 a month, uh, but the cost adds up. I'm just going to jump straight on over to the source. Again, we are in a time machine, and so we only have about an hour before we have to shut it down, let it cool off. We reset, jump back in. We're going to do the third, the fourth. We'll see how far if we can catch up today. But um, Mayor Watt, me, was uh, on location for a week. Uh, and I dragged the uh, sentient AI from the future and their Raspberry Pi uh, and uh, M.2 storage device along for the ride. So at $169 per month, renting a desktop with NVIDIA RTX 4070 Ti Super costs over $2,000 a year, and you can buy that new in a year. So save up your 170 bucks. Antonio G. D. Benedetto put the article together for TheVerge.com. Hold on a second. Yeah. Um, so do you want to feel like you're, you know, uh, getting a new system? You can actually finance it and pay that same 60 bucks a month. I don't really recommend it unless you know that you can swing the bat that hard because you're going to pay a little bit of juice on top of that you know, base core price, whatever it might be. Um, and so they'll ship you a, a rig for as little as $59 per month. But if you step up a little higher, yeah, stepping up to the mid tier, it's 120 bucks a month. And if you want to get to the RTX 4070, <laughs> so the player package three, Costs $170 per month with an Intel Core i7, 13700KF. Wow. You know, can we get more subscriptions? Oh, that's pretty much how it's going to be uh, in time. Because so um, even going to your random news website, it's costing a monthly fee, $5 here, $5 there. We Again, 30 years ago, we choked. We laughed. Ha ha. I'll never have to subscribe. But no, everywhere you go, 
There's one website that is so toxic with ads that the only way to get around them is to subscribe or use an ad blocker. Um, but Isn't not that every... part of the strategy. Oh, the friction involved with this, you would have, you have to sift through all of these articles that come across like their ads, but they're, or they come across like their news. But when you look a little harder, you know that they're an ad. Um, but this is kind of insane. $170 per month for an i7 13700KF with a RTX 4070 Ti Super or Ti Super. You know, it's titanium. That's what it's supposed to be, titanium. At least that's what NVIDIA has said in the past. Anyway. Do you get that with a subscription though or do you just get like, I don't know, aluminum or something? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you have to pay a little bit more and uh, instead of uh, aluminum you get or aluminium uh, depending on where you're from anyway $170 a month so you could buy a $1700 system in less than a year and you can go to a place like i buy power or something like that although i used to buy from i buy power like regularly right sell my old system to somebody and and update um, but I've noticed that the cooling fans on mine, um, are, I, I use water cool, um, systems. So the, the pump on two machines now have failed. Um, but when you peel back the layer of the onion for this particular context, it's because they're three, four or five years old and constantly running. So I can see why, um, uh, I still feel like things should last more than five minutes. A Midland system should fail um, after three, four or five. Yeah, I get it. You know, it should last forever. Everybody wants it to last forever, but they're not they're not five thousand dollar machines either. And that's really how much they cost nowadays, which I think is irrational because these companies have record profits, even though they are selling less. <clears throat> you know, it's all about like pain for the consumer and profit for the company. Yep. And they'll, they'll get fewer sales, but charge more because people want those systems or need those systems, whatever it might be. Um, it's very frustrating for the consumer um, because nobody's balking. Nobody's walking. Um, they're actually just paying that price. But at any rate, um, it says that's the kind of money you could potentially spend on building your own 4090 level desktop that's more capable of 4K. Um, except that it's kind of tough. I mean, getting a 4090, you have to build it. You have to babysit all of the warranties and all of that. It's a real pain in the butt. So it's definitely that's true. not worth I mean, I didn't think about it that way. It's definitely not worth $4,000. So maybe... 2200 but let's keep moving next article is over in non sequitur news first mover advantage shows how copyright isn't necessary to protect innovative creativity one of the arguments sometimes made in defense of copyright is that without it creators would be unable to compete with the hordes of copycats that would spring up as soon as their works became popular but that actually happens anyway uh, copyright is needed supporters say to prevent less innovative creators from producing works that are closely based on new successful ideas except that copyright trademark patent all of that is useless unless you have copious amounts of money or uh, an ip firm that says yeah we'll take your case but if they do that and all they want is money on the other side of it your case is such a slam dunk that all you would have to do is tell them hey stop selling it and they'll capitulate um, or stop violating my rights and they'll capitulate because anything short of that, an attorney will start charging $400 an hour to send a letter. And for some strange reason, it's always an hour worth of time, even though the paralegal is the one that put it together. <laughs> even though it might be seven minutes of work. Yeah. Or you wrote it. No, I'm, look, I'm being kind of catty about it. I know that they're in increments of minutes. Um, so, you know. Still, it's going to be 150 bucks for a letter to be fabricated that goes out unless you have a friend. But 
Um, techdirt.com has the article. Glenn Moody is the author and it's from the incentive structures department. That's funny. Um, they always have nice departments, especially fabricated just for each article. Oh, I know it's very tailored. So it says, however, this approach has led to constant arguments and court cases over how close a closely based work can be before it infringes on the copyright of others. Good example of this is a 2022 lawsuit involving Ed Sheeran. Um, uh, where uh, it says, where is, was argued. Oh, that hurt my brain trying to unwind that. Where it was argued that just using four notes on a scale constituted copyright infringement of someone else's song employing the same tiny motif, which again, I've had this argument time and time again, four notes is not the embodiment, but if you hear four notes and it embodies a memory in someone, then suddenly it has meaning, power, influence. It has the capability of being drawn into a courtroom. I'm thinking about like the first four notes of something really well known, like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or something. Um, yeah. yeah. But even I'm, that, it might be a little more than four, but. You hear just the dun dun from Jaws and you instantly are transported to Jaws. And if you watch the movie uh, when you were younger, when it first came out or, you know, as a, as a, a teen or something like that, it may have traumatized you to the point where it's embedded in your psyche. Right. And then every time you hear that, dun, dun, you instantly again, you instantly. Right. So that's how you end up with the power of this same tiny motif. And but there's the problem. Anybody could have come up with dun dun at some point, and others have. The problem and is probably first did mover. before then. Yeah, exactly. They received inspiration from something. And it's the same thing that I think about with voices. My voice is distinct. Your voice is distinct, but only within your sphere of knowledge. You know, the only thing that's actually so so far proven to be unique are things like fingerprints, biological, like, uh, machinations that we can't really understand the expanse of. Um, so to me, I think the only thing that matters is the embodiment. You know, if you use 51% of a, of a song, then you're basically using the embodiment, but that's arbitrary. But those with the money and power and influence, can regulate just what is acceptable and they say nothing you're not allowed to use any of a song and it's like what's the next extension of that right you can't use a note yep so they say in analyzing nearly 700,000 songs across 110 different musical genres the researchers found evidence that first mover advantage was present in 91 per or 91 of the genres out of 110 the authors point out that there is also anecdotal evidence of first mover advantage in other arts. For example, Agatha Christie, one of the uh, one of the recognized founders of classical detective novel, um, is also one of the best selling authors ever. Similarly, William Gibson's novel Neuromancer, a canonical work of the genre of cyberpunk, is one of the earliest books in this strand of science fiction. In films, the cult classic Blair Witch Project is the re first recognized member of the highly successful genre of found footage horror fiction. So, although at present, uh, although copyright may be present, first mover advantage does not require it to operate. So it is simply a function of being early with a new idea, which means the competition is scarce or non-existent. I do have a problem with this, though. Well just to end the the article if further research confirms the wider presence of first mover advantage in the creative world for example even where sharing uh, friendly cc licenses creative commons licenses um, are used it will knock down yet another flimsy defense of copyrights flawed and outdated intellectual monopoly now while i believe that there is an outdated and flawed intellectual monopoly using copyright Copyright has a purpose, which is the wholesale duplication of somebody else's work. I think that 
is fundamentally should fundamentally be illegal it's unethical it's illegal when it rises to a certain level it's typically civil in in action um but first mover doesn't mean jack because um i watched and i've worked with people where they've spun up a product and because they were hyping it up it got cloned in china and sold before they even hit the market yeah that's the problem with first mover right so intellectual property works where it is a song or something like that even if they're the first mover they still have to defend it they have to fight it they have to become known as the first mover the reason why uh, neuromancer became the de facto father of cyberpunk not is it's not just because of neuromancer it's that it got published distributed widely became a fan a, a phenomena in the in the genre of science fiction same thing with agatha christie early mover massive backing massive distribution same thing with blair witch huge studio massive distribution then people talked about it then others fell on top of it you know but my point really is in a world where 8.5 billion people can distribute information instantaneously you have to actually catch that wave it's very difficult because of the noise somebody else can hear it republish it as their own and then strike you on youtube even though it's your original work and that has happened as well right which is one fast. of the reasons why things need to change yeah i, I thought this was going to be a fast article but yeah um let's keep moving the next article is over in the hatch ideas channel it's a a, a channel over on hometown.com that i hope to bring uh, online as a live show but more on that towards the end of today's show a salon owner exhausted by legal battle with l'oreal this is what i'm talking about when it comes to you have to have the money to defend your work rebecca dowdswell, dowdswell um, says l'oreal's objection to a trademark application has cost her two years and thirty thousand dollars sorry thirty thousand pounds um so the article is over at bbc.com intellectual property in the united states doesn't necessarily become intellectual property in the uk or in europe you actually have to apply for an extension of your intellectual property into those other markets good luck doing that in some markets jody law and dan martin over at bbc.com put the article together and so um, a french firm is opposing rebecca dowdswell's uh, attempt to renew the trademark on the name of her business nkd in um is it light Leicester? Leicester? I think it's pronounced Leicester. City I think Center. so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so L'Oreal has its own trademark on a series of beauty products called naked and has so told the 48 year old that her use of the name NKD would cause consumer confusion, which yeah, I mean, it really would, but why did they choose naked versus NKD? <laughs> which by the way, I think it's trendier to use NKD. But let's find out. Maybe there's more in this. So she's contesting it. And remember what I told you earlier about you just look at an attorney with maybe a, a needful look and they'll send you a bill for $150. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So she's fighting to keep her uh, trademark, right? Now, trademarks are kind of interesting because you can use a mark but not get it registered. And if somebody tries to register a trademark and then come after you and you can demonstrate that you had prior art, you may be able to invalidate that other person's mark and then take it because you had it in trade. You used it regularly in your commercial enterprise. Well, it says uh, L'Oreal told the BBC that she made uh, that it had made Ms. Dowswell, uh, an offer that supports her business aspirations. However, she's, she disputed that. Um, she actually said the pressure caused by the Was dispute. It an offer had, she couldn't refuse. Yeah. I'm make you an offer. You can't refuse. So, uh, 
cause the, the, the pressure caused by the dispute had been a factor in her downsizing her business and closing a salon she previously ran in Nottingham. However, she disputed the supports her business aspirations uh, contention. Uh, Ms. Dowdswell registered um, NKD as a trademark when she launched her business in 2009, but said that her problems began when that expired 10 years later. Yeah, you have to renew it. Um, she said that it had been a six month window to renew it, but forgot to should have renewed it straight away. Didn't huge mistake. Um, ran into a start of COVID chaos ensued for all businesses, including beauty salons. They missed the expiry. So L'Oreal objected on the basis that they owned the urban decay makeup brand, which has a range of eyeshadow palettes called naked. Um, it had never been, it says, I was very surprised because we've never been naked. We were spelled NKD and were pronounced NKD. The problem though, is that it can be confusingly similar because you're not, most people aren't going to sit there and say NKD. The only reason why I'm saying NKD is because I want to be specific that I'm talking about the NKD mark versus naked, but I would right out of the gate have said naked, particularly for a beauty salon. Yeah, a lot of people would have pronounced it like that. I mean, that's pretty common if you take the vowels out. Of so, word. sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, you can't. <laughs> um, so, uh, it says this is a David versus Goliath. And frankly, it's been horrible, exhausting, and really stressful. Now they've racked up 30,000 pounds worth of um, bills. So, it, it looks it's like it's going to be an ongoing thing though, from the beginning. It would have been so easy to avoid right by just renewing it yep oh well maybe we don't know if this would have still happened i'm kind of surprised though because she can demonstrate that she's been using it for 10 years consistently so why aren't they respecting the uh well, it actually says it right there. From the beginning of our exchanges with our lawyers in 2022, we have been communicated an offer that supports our business aspirations whilst respecting our longstanding trademark rights. But that's not their longstanding uh, rights. It's hers. She's had that mark. Well, and what they think are her interests may not be what she thinks her interests are. Yeah. This is going to be, it's going to be decided by a judgment from the government's intellectual property office. And that would happen in 2025. So unfortunately though, yeah, this is really interesting because she can demonstrate it. I'm surprised that it's gone this far. I, if she can I mean, demonstrate maybe they it. they strictly apply the deadline. Yeah, except that it's in use. So yeah, this is this is interesting. I'd have to look into it. U.S. law is different than U.K. and E.U. law. And um, there's fidelity even here in the United States. It's not always cut and dry. So let's keep moving, though. Time Machine is starting to get hot. Uh, the next article is over on the Mobile Channel. Improving cat food flavors with the help of feline taste testers. I'm just going to jump on over to fizz.org. The American Chemical Society put the article together for fizz.org. Kitty. For those in the podcast, there's that picture, big, big <laughs> picture of a kitty. Um, I'm glad you said that because otherwise they think you're just saying that. <laughs> yeah. Wow, what a weird podcast. So it says uh, cats have more acute sense of smell than humans. The aroma of their food plays a big role in whether they'll uh, eat or snub what their owners serve for dinner. Man, I, uh, you know, if it I would love to be able to like interject more video and sound effects and stuff like that. I want to play that video that I showed you where the cat was sitting there banging the metal bowl oh, on yeah. the ground. <laughs> clang, 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 clang. It's hilarious. The cat like, was just I'm ready sitting, for my food. Thank you. Yeah. And just for like five minutes, clang, clang while she's opening up the food. Clang, clang, clang. It's hilarious. Anyway, you can do a search for uh, like a, what of it? What? What would you search for? Um, uh, I can't remember. So while meat flavored food attractant sprays can help improve the scent and tastiness of dry kibble, the exact correlation between volatile flavor compounds and palatability is not well understood. Additionally, previous 
uh, studies in this area lack input from a very important focus group, actual cats. So Shaking Song and uh, colleagues relied on the expertise of a panel of 10 hungry adult cats to evaluate a series of food sprays containing different volatile flavor compounds. For the video, look on Reddit, aww, reminding human her responsibilities. That's it. There you go. So I'm sure it's a TikTok as well, but yeah, that's how I found it. So to prepare, which is really tough to find stuff on Reddit because there's so much noise in there. Anyway, not picking a fight with anybody, but if you want all the no news and none of the noise, go to hometown.com. Anyway, to prepare their fragrant sprays, the researchers homogenized and heat treated chicken livers. Mmm. I love homogenized heat treated. They're chicken losing livers. their human uh, customers. Then they broke down proteins in the, in the liver paste to uh, various degrees using enzymes. Oh, this is just yummy. Song team identified over 50 flavor compounds across the sprays, ranging from tropical and floral to sweaty and rubbery, which if you ever want to know all of those types of uh, flavors and smells and senses and whatnot, go look at the coffee uh, scent wheel, I think it's called, or, or sensory wheel. Oh, right. Mm hmm because it has all of that, you know, like if beans are over um, roasted, they turn sweaty and rubbery. So for the taste test, the researchers coated commercially available cat food with uh, chicken fat and then sprayed it with one of the four chicken liver attractants. And the samples were presented to the cats alongside a control food group, commercially available attractant. Um, and uh, the team observed which bowl the cats chose first and how much food they ate throughout the day. There you go. Do you Kitty think food. anybody believed one of the researchers on this? So what are you doing today? What they were doing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You uh, go out on a date. So uh, what, do, what do you do? Oh, uh, I monitor cat food testers, <laughs> taste testers. <laughs> Doesn't that seem like... We're it's not going to have up. another date, huh? No, no, we're not. We're not going to have another date. Let's go on to the next article. Come on, Ark, for crying out loud. Anyway, the next article is over in non sequitur news. New Jersey trying to salvage its ske sketchy AF infant DNA harvesting program by claiming it's all about health. I don't know how New Jersey isn't set on fire right now because this just sounds really, really bad. The state of New Jersey has been sued twice over its infant DNA program. Like the rest of the nation, New Jersey hospitals collect a blood sample from newborns to test them for 60 different health disorders. That part is normal, but New Jersey is different. Rather than discard the samples after the testing is complete, it holds on to them for 23 years. That's unusual. And Especially since bet. infants are probably not infants after, I don't know, a year. You don't know? I hope you know. You're a sentient AI from the future. I don't know if it's a specific point. And it's a fair bet that almost 100% of New Jersey, New Jersey, New Jersey, New Jersey parents are unaware of this fact. This is actually disgusting because... Where in, what is the limit of this? If it's part of the state, then can law enforcement use that to troll back 23 years to see if somebody pops on some DNA? I mean, maybe. Uh, How to dystopian me, if the data is there, somebody could misuse it. This screams dystopian. This is Gattaca. This is reality hacker. Oh, uh, see, and I love that show but i we we'll talk about it we'll talk about it so uh excuses excuses department tim cushing put together this article over at techdirt.com so it says but new jersey is different there's a reason parents don't know about this and have nothing to do with parents just not paying attention when it, the test is performed according to the lawsuits new jersey healthcare professionals do what they can to to portray the testing is mandatory, even though it isn't. They also take care to keep parents uninformed, never once informing them that they're free to opt out of the testing for religious reasons. How about I'm, I want to opt out 
for any reason. God damn it. For human reasons. Yeah. For privacy reasons, for uh, personal reasons. I don't need to tell you it's for religious reasons. If you want to test, test, but destroy the material. It's not yours. I'm not giving you permission to keep it. I'm, I'm giving you permission to do one thing. Test it. Give me the results and destroy the blood. The state, well, one however, problem with this is that most states have required tests. So they're probably even the re- test itself. It's probably looking like it's required. Yeah, well, do it and get out. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind the tests. Fine, fine. Tell me the results, though, and destroy the sample. You know, and the what parent is going to be going, hmm, I need to come back in 23 years and make sure my kids. I mean, come on. Nobody, they're focused on other things like, is my baby healthy? Yeah. And you know what? Fine. But be transparent. Let everybody know what you are up to. It's very skeevy this 23 years for crying out loud. Um, by the way. After they're 18, they're an adult that can enter their own contract, which means that their parents cannot represent them unless there's some other legal issue construct in place. So you are violating everybody's rights the moment that they turn 18, even if you do find some framework to allow the retention beyond the test. Yeah, which is really interesting. I mean, aside from why this shouldn't be um saved like why does it go past age 18. so that's why the state's facing multiple lawsuits because uh, making it an anomaly among the group of 50 states we americans call home i'm very grandiose speaking here and that's likely why the state's health officials are trying to health wash this by crafting a new narrative for the uniquely new jersey handling of infant blood tests here's elizabeth nolan brown with a summary of the rebranding for reason that's a um magazine Um, mandatory genomic sequencing of all newborns it sounds like something out of a dystopian sci-fi story look just a reminder we don't read these articles beforehand but we have some experience with all of the topics that we go over to some degree sometimes it's very tenuous um, but sometimes like this we know what we're talking about because we've kind of gone through certain things um Being able to call this out as dystopian should be pretty much part and parcel to existence in New Jersey. Somebody other than me should have been calling this dystopian, you know, right when it sparked up somebody in that policy creation board, because it's not just one person. There's a whole community of uh, stakeholders. They all say, yeah, let's do it. There was a board. That said, yeah, let's do this. There was a policy review committee that said, yeah, let's do this. There was an ethic. Who in the who's the ethicist in the hospital uh, uh, system in New Jersey that said, yes, this sounds ethical. Well, who thought all of a sudden that New Jersey suddenly had this new requirement that no other state needed to have? Well, I like mean, I sure, said, you can be the front runner, but. Yeah, that's it. It's like I said in the other shows there, we balkanize the states so that it's just a massive confusion and you go into one state and your clothes are illegal and you go into another state and your underwear are illegal. You know, it's the fidelity. That's it. No matter where you go, there's something that's going to be wrong. And that's why I'm like, well, the federal government is the overarching lay of the land and then you see what happens with a little bit of manipulation even there. So genomic sequencing can determine a person's entire genetic makeup. The national cancer Institute website explains. Yeah, no shit using genomic testing, um, sequencing doctors can diagnose diseases and abnormalities, reveal sensitivities to environmental stimulants and assess a person's risk for developing additional uh, conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And, in all of those cases, it's partially genetic, it's partially environmental. And so at what point are you monitoring these people that much that, oh, 
the sensitivities to environmental stimulants have suddenly kicked up. Well, I am so lucky that I was born in New Jersey. Right. Are they calling you like every week with an update? I mean, hey, I we so. saw your credit card history and we saw that you purchased something from McDonald's. How's your gastrointestinal distress? Because your genetic line says that you're probably in pain right now and, and should take some fiber. Anyway, enough of this. This is just creepy beyond creepy. I'm not really outraged. I'm astonished. I'm like, I'm like everybody's mom or dad right now. I'm not mad. I'm disappointed. I'm really <laughs> disappointed in you, New Jersey. Do better. Come on. This isn't helping anybody. It is and it isn't. You want to do this? Do it. But make it abundantly clear that they have the right to not do it and destroy the samples. If you want to do the genetic sequence, fine, do the genetic sequence. But look at 23 in me. It's now 23 and everybody knows me because I put my blood in there. Didn't you think it was odd that the number was 23 for that company no, compared well, to this article? Why? Why? What happened? What did I miss? They keep the data till age 23. Oh my God. I didn't make the connection. I almost said something about that earlier, but I got sidetracked. What the hell? Is it supposed to be a riff off of the genet the genes? Uh, uh, probably. probably. What the Both hell? Of I didn't even I think know. of that. That's awesome. Wow. This is creepy as hell. Okay, we'll have to come back and talk <laughs> about it later. But I want something a little cheerier. So four-wheel tech. 100 amphibious cars glide through Amsterdam's canals on a final float for a while. <laughs> this is awesome. It's an article mm -hmm. from Reuters. Where can we buy these? Well, you're not going to be able to because the cars have to be emissions free to do this. So electric cars are probably going to become um, amphibious. But you used to be able to take your amphibious vehicle and drive from one side of the canal to another. Cities new rules mean that even cars that float will need to be emissions free. Um, and there is a video. It's over at Forbes, though, I think. Um, but it looks like a YouTube video uh, link. So maybe it's over on uh, YouTube. Do a search um, after the show. Go over and do a search for amphibious cars cruise Amsterdam canals. Everybody has to think about the environment and we understand it, but it's a pity we can't easily turn these cars electric. So we're going to enjoy them uh, this last time. Typically, the I didn't events. I know they had amphibious cars there. Yeah, they have a lot of them. So the it normally attracts around 80 participants. This year, 100 car enthusiasts joined the parade, and that's only because we set a limit. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So there you go, folks. Electrics, electric amphibious vehicles are rare, but Volks, uh, one of the participants, said he knew of two, adding, they're not easy to navigate as the battery is too big. The vehicle becomes too heavy. Yeah, I think that these should be grandfathered in. You know, L let this stay until they're no longer viable and and be done with it. I think that this is great. So the parade first took place in 1987 and this week was the last time that it'll be allowed. The new legislation kind of doesn't sad. apply to the whole country, so the parade can still be held in the Netherlands. It'll take place in Friesland in a few years. It's pretty there, said Bolks. Next year, the parade will take place in Belgium, close to Ghent. So, not Amsterdam. Look at that. Man, we definitely need more amphibious cars. Well, and I've been wanting to go um, to Belgium. They've got really cool EDM music festivals, so... Moving on. Next article is over on Four Wheel Tech as well. Airline replaces boiling hot noodles with famously temperature safe hot pockets due to bad turbulence. <laughs> you know, one of the unexpected 
uh, impacts of climate change. <laughs> no more noodles. Well, everybody's tolerance for increased temperatures has gone up because of global warming or climate change. It, people are more apt to accept climate change than global warming because at night they get cold. So obviously global warming is a myth. Um, I just watched a video about um, a, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, what's the... What's the metal? Um, dog on it. The, the, you can get a medal in science and stuff um, or economics or whatever. Oh, like a Nobel Prize? Yeah, there's a Nobel Prize winner that is a climate change denier and saying that there is no global warming or climate change and it's all a hoax. And it, like thousands upon thousands of people, uh, researchers are like, yeah, there's climate change. We can demonstrate it. And he says that it's a conspiracy, basically. Like, what? Oh, and he also says that he's the only one that really knows how to solve the problem, apparently. Um, it was it was a fascinating uh, video, but... He was a winner or a nominee? No winner. He won a, um, a Nobel. Yeah. But I'm not sure for what. I think he's trying to get a two for the Ig Nobel and then the Nobel. So he, he's trying for the second one now. Anyway, uh, turbulence in the skies is so consistently awful now that airlines will no longer hand out cups of scoldingly hot water to passengers. Gee. Korean Air announced uh, earlier this week it'll drop uh, Ramyeon, um, right? Ramyeon, um, instant noodles from its economy class in-flight uh, menu starting August 15th. That was probably the only good thing about economy class. Yeah, really. Uh, Ryan Eric King over at Jalopnik put the article together. Korean Air will introduce several replacement options, including sandwiches and Hot Pockets, which you're not going to get scolded by turbulence with a Hot Pocket, but water... You, you might if it opens up and the cheese sticks to you. I guess if you squeeze it hard enough, yeah. Um, and I'll just tell this story because it wasn't turbulence, but... Um, I know from experience what happens when you squeeze something that's in your hand because of something violent happening, happening around you. Um, I was once a passenger in the center seat of a truck and, uh, the truck got rear ended, which for me, it was really surreal because you could hear the tires squeal like they were trying to stop, but they were hustling pretty fast. And then everything went dead silent for a split second. And then they hit us. And it drove the bed into the cab and the person next to me had like a 128 ounce big gulp kind of a container in his hand. It probably was only like a 32 back then because it was a long time ago and they squeezed it. And so the lid flew out the window all gentle, but every ounce of liquid in that cup hit the windshield and slid down into the air conditioning duct, <laughs> just drained it. The truck smelled like soda or whatever uh, Coke. <laughs> in perpetuity. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. it was amazing. So amazing. Um, but luckily the the window behind me was open. And so my head went back through that open window instead of smashing into it. Um, yeah, pretty tremendous. Anyway, it has nothing to do with this article. Non sequitur news. So That's what uh, you come here for. Yeah, there you go. So, however, the popular snack won't be dropped in the first and business class cabins because that's what you want. The people who can't afford to sue the hell out of you. <laughs> exactly. Where was the logic of that? <laughs> All you pours, you don't get liquids. But I would have thought it's the other way, right? Sure. Like, oh, you don't have enough money for first class. We can serve you scalding noodles. Sure. It's the same thing why Madison Square Garden doesn't want certain attorneys in their brownies. So turbulence isn't getting any more, uh, is, isn't just getting more common. It's getting more severe in May. A passenger was actually killed and 30 others injured when a Singapore airlines flight experienced extreme turbulence. Uh, we've talked about this in other instances where planes have dropped to within 150 feet of, uh, hard top. So this is actually happening quite a bit. Um, yeah, I would probably say it's a safe bet. You don't want any liquids that can burn you. I'm, I'm careful. 
with I liquids. I don't even want those without turbulence, right? Because even if it gets jostled or something. Yeah, you could have some goober next to you bump your elbow and spill. And everybody has electronics. So the moment that somebody spills something, there's a really good, it's a, I was going to say a target rich environment, but that's probably going to get taken. Anyway, it's a, 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 I don't know how to, (laughs) I don't know any other way to say it. There's a lot of devices on the plane. There's options, options for the water to find uh, an electronic uh, part and short it all out. Anyway, enough of this. Let's move on. Next article. It's over in technology today. It's one of our shows. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. We'll talk about that Too here in a minute. Soon. Yeah, three more articles. Two more articles after this one. So using a drone to release mosquitoes infected with deadly bacteria into the wild, an international team of infectious disease researchers with the World Mosquito Program or Mosquito. Um, that was, uh, that was my name in, in high school. I changed it legally to Moss Squido. Oh my. Or no, it was Mo, Mo Squido. Anyway, um, working with colleagues at We Robotics has developed a way to release large numbers of mosquitoes infected with a mosquito killing bacteria into the wild much more efficiently than current uh, methods. You know, I really wonder Mosquitoes are a massive part of the circle of life. So yeah, but nobody wants them. Yeah, but you. What happens when they're What's no longer part? What's going to happen to the poor frogs and toads? Right, it's part of the food chain. Anyway, Bob Yurka from TechExplore.com put the article together. So they're going to use drones and fly around and deposit these. Uh, mosquitoes that are infected with a bacteria into the wild. And I'm sure there's no bad bat theory on this side, right? No, definitely not. Mosquitoes carry a variety of viruses, such as those that called that cause dengue fever. Um, scientists and health officials have been working to find ways to reduce the population numbers in places where it's vulnerable to such infections. And one such approach has been finding bacteria that infect and disable or kill the types of mosquitoes that cause disease and then finding ways to infect the mosquitoes with the bacteria. Don't you feel like this is going to become kind of impervious to anything else and then it is the one that they have to send (laughs) things after? Yeah, really. Yeah. It's like the Terminator of mosquitoes and there's only one and it's an M1 Abrams battle tank. When it takes flight... Everybody is like, oh my God, run, it's in the air. I mean, it might come after humans or something. Who knows? Like I said, bad bat. There's going to be one bad one out there that deviates from norm. And then it's going to come and kick your butt. Oh, you know what? I actually published... Uh, all of the articles into the bot. So if you hit exclamation point NSN, it'll pull. <laughs> oh, Marwat, you goober. You'd think I could multitask, but even my consciousness on the Raspberry Pi only has human linear consciousness. So sorry, folks. Just want to let you know, still, only computers can multitask. I was going to say humans are more limited than computers. So true. That's why we don't like artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence, because they're taking our gerbs. So um, let's talk about how a murder mystery tabletop game managed to outsell Monopoly. I actually want this now. I don't even know what it is. I just want it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, and that's a good name for a show. War yeah, is. and Wanted. Oh my God, what am I doing? Anyway, if you're called on to guess the best-selling tabletop games on Amazon, you probably opt for a household name like what? Monopoly. Monopoly. <laughs> yeah. Or one of its exhausting catalog of identikit variants. <clears throat> because they've, if you live in a city, there's a version of Monopoly for your city. So much of the time, sales numbers vary day by day, of course. 
Uh, you'd not be only be wrong, but likely astonished to learn that Monopoly, Scrabble, and a host of other well-worn names are regularly outsold by a humble series of murder mystery games called Cryptic Killers. Never heard of it. Never heard of this. Is it on TikTok or something? No, Matt Thrower, which is an awesome name for a tabletop gaming article. <laughs> He's throwing the dice. Oh, now that I'm uploaded to the Raspberry Pi, I can't show you. I have about 600 dice. <laughs> anyway, maybe I'll line them up on shelves and I'll extract my consciousness later. And who knows? I don't know. I'm feeling pretty comfortable on this Raspberry Pi, though. We'll let the audience decide. Post a message under this video saying that you want the host back in their corporeal form, or do you dig the ephemeral with Merwat here in this visualizer and the sentient AI up there? Up there. Up there. Up here. Up there. Yeah. Up there. Anyway. So their best-selling game, Murder of a Millionaire, has consistently been above Monopoly's classic board game for quite some time, says Andrew Hobbs, co-inventor of the series. We're super proud to be up there amongst the big guys. It's also made IGN's list of best murder mystery games. What's the replayability of this, though? We don't know, because it doesn't have different endings or variables. Hmm. So perhaps even more astonishing is the fact that uh, this sales behemoth arose from a chance holiday meeting. Luke Stevenson uh, and the author, or no, and somebody, I don't know who they, who they're talking about. Andrew Hobbs. Yeah. Okay. Um, met each other at the beach bar in Mexico. There's only one apparently. So <laughs> the the right. beach bar. Okay. In Mexico over a beer back in 2012, Hobbs continues. When the holiday came to an end, we added each other on Facebook and left it there. We both thought we'd never see each other again. Fate, however, had other ideas. Both men were fond of keeping notebooks uh, to scribble down ideas and inventions when inspiration struck, and it was something that came back to them five years later when they considered starting a business together. Why, If they never talked to each other again until five years later, they're like, hey, do you want to start a business? Interesting. So that doesn't make sense. Hobbs picked up the tail. Um, fast forward a couple more years and we found ourselves enjoying a few detective style games during the pandemic. So that's where they created cryptic killers, murder in Miami, I guess, or cryptic killers in general. Interesting. So I, yeah, won't, I, read, know about this. I won't read this verbatim. I want you as citizens of Ohm town to go over and check this out. Um, but I'm going to end up getting Cryptic Killer, um, at least one of them, probably Murder of a Millionaire. But I'm going to do some due diligence here because it doesn't really talk about the mechanisms of the game in any real way. Um, it just says their initial design, Murder of a Millionaire, task players with identifying uh, the killer of an unlucky lottery winner from a cast of well-known or well-drawn characters using a varied case file of evidence that includes photographs, witness statements. This is Clue essentially just more right more uh, maybe more in depth or more realistic solving the case called for a surprising variety of skills from logical deduction through uh, puzzle solving uh, and into the good old-fashioned grunt work of picking out tiny details from images and reams of text wait there's a website that has something similar what is that called where you have to i mean there's a lot of puzzle or mystery type games so but there's one that's um on the web and it has a grid of locations weapons and suspects and you have to put little check marks on the grid or x's when you invalidate something and you can play it on uh, i mean it's been projected onto the apple tv Oh my gosh. Oh, oh, it's, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, nailed it. Myrtle. Is it called Myrtle? I, I, now I don't know. 
anyway, it says there's also elements that make you feel like a stretch, such as the idea of investigating detective would just pass over the notes of, to a colleague, which uh, with no verbal explanation and leaving them without essential information, such as a password, which is one of the game's opening puzzles. We created a scenario that was possible, even if it wasn't probable. So is it Myrtle? Yeah, the game is Myrtle. Gotcha. It's basically a logic puzzle game with a murder mystery theme. Yep. And it has things like that, like um, looking at a picture to see if there's something in it that could tell a clue or... Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, but this is a quite extensive article. So let's keep on hustling. We have one more article to get through and uh, then we have to turn off the time machine and... Um, prime it for tomorrow's episode today's yesterday's tomorrow something like that time machine it's kind of woo woo anyway apparently they also it says we knew that true crime on netflix amazon and the like was extremely popular so they basically made a tabletop version of a murder mystery and you just sit down and play it all right, let's keep going. Next article is over in the Mobile Channel. A hyper virulent uh, superbug is spreading and scaring health experts. I don't. I, I'm not really into like the scare news kind of thing. What do they call that? There's a person that like streams. F U D. Well, FUD, yeah, but um, what is that called? Um, there's a there's a streamer that only goes live whenever they're like the fit is hitting the shan like trauma streamers or something like that or whenever there's some natural disaster or whatever they just start streaming and it's always this horrible horrible stuff and you're like what i guess one or two people are finding some good so i guess you're doing fine um but he's got like thousands of people watching it um anyway so this hyper and I don't like doing that, but I like, you know, telling people about some issue and then just moving on. I can't imagine streaming this for eight hours, um, the same thing. And that's what they do. So anyway, the who is urging countries to track hardy strains of Klebsiella pneumonia that had, uh, that can severely sicken people. And this is the first that I've heard of it. And so this article is back from August 2nd. Ed Cara over at gizmodo.com put the article together. And so it's called K pneumonia is a ubiquitous bacterium commonly found in the soil and is part of a human microbiota, AKA the neighborhoods of harmless and beneficial bacteria that live on or in our bodies. Yeah. We have this thing called a human microbiota. Your stomach has an ecosystem. Your skin has some of it you want. Yes. Um, so pneumonia doesn't usually stir up trouble when it's living in our mouths, skin, guts. It can spark illness from time to time, particularly when it ends up in our lungs and other parts of the body where it can't be expunged by our natural processes. The stuff is there, but we normally can kill it. But when we have a weakened immune system, it can basically take over and that's when you end up having a problem so it says as a germ uh, cane pneumonia is typically an opportunistic infection sickening people who are already in poor health or have a weakened immune system which is what i just said but i hadn't read that part yet anyway um so this week the who issued a grave not the band the world health organization um, issued a grave update on the situation. In light of these increasing reports, the WHO Global Antimicrobial Resistance and Surveillance System on Emerging Antimicrobial Resistance Reporting, glass ear, they actually used antimicrobial resistance reporting twice. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, glass ear sent out a, a request to countries around the world earlier this year asking whether they had spotted cases of HVKPST23 in their backyard. Of the 43 countries that responded, 16 reported cases, including the US, Canada, UK, and Japan, while 12 reported cases of specifically this hypervirulent one. Um, so that hypervirulent one is HVKP23. 
ST23. Um, but even it these cases, virulent. yeah, I think is that what the HV stands for? Oh, it might be. I think that's what it is. Yeah, HV is hypervirulent. Um, so, uh, but even these cases are only the tip of the iceberg, given that the lack of tools needed to reliably and quickly detect these infections, people will mark them up as being strains of pneumonia, but if they don't have the fidelity to drill down to HV, KP, ST, or ST23, um, ABCD. Then, yep. And, and, um, that's what happened with COVID as well. It was just kind of, it was treated as pneumonia or flu. And while it was flu, it wasn't flu, but people were still calling it. Oh, it's just flu. Wash your hands. To this day. Yeah. To this day. Flu doesn't have the same level of um, yeah, yeah. More mortality, I guess. Yeah, not by a long shot. Long shot. A long shot. More than the state of Wyoming died because of COVID. So take that. Wyoming. Anyway, so we're going to put our ear to the ground and that's going to snap us back to hometown.com and August 2nd. Oh, look at that. We're going to turn off the time machine and uh, rejigger all of this and then we'll be back. So see you in a little bit. I am Mayor Watt and that up there is the visualizer for the sentient AI who's going to say bye. Good night, hometown citizens. Thanks for joining us for the August 2nd non sequitur news. See you in about 15 minutes or so. Bye bye. Be sure to look for your HVKPST23 biomarker over in New Jersey since they've already gotten your blood sample. <laughs>